Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we hear from opponents of a plan to help fund education through legalized marijuana. We'll update preparations for the college football playoff in Glendale, and we'll learn about a plan to create art programs for senior citizens. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Efforts to find a settlement in a $2 billion lawsuit against the state over inflation-adjusted education funding failed today. That means the suit is headed back to court. At issue is $1.3 billion in unpaid inflation adjustments. The court had ruled that the state must begin resetting those adjustments, but that ruling is on appeal. Last week, we heard from those in support of a proposed ballot measure that would legalize marijuana and use tax proceeds for marijuana sales for education. Tonight, the other side is represented by Seth Liebson. He is with the Arizonans for Responsible Drug Policy. Good to have you here. Thanks, Thanks for joining Ted. us. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. Uh, why not legalize minimum amounts of marijuana? Uh, I think we have to read the law to know what's in the law. I don't want to pass it and then find out. I've read through the law. I don't know that it's limited or minimum amounts. When you look at individuals being able to own six plants or households being over to, able to own 12 plants, you're looking at 1,800, 3,600 possible joints when you consider a plant could give you five ounces of marijuana, just one plant. That's not a minimum amount. That's a drug dealer's dream and a children's youth policy nightmare. Um, why not okay for adults over 21? In theory, it sounds good, but as we know and as that campaign to legalize says, they want to make it like alcohol. How's that worked out for alcohol in this state or across the country? You can't legalize a dangerous substance here or anywhere in the United States without it finding its way into the slipstream of our youth. And that's why we have something like 25% of Arizonans' youth using alcohol on a regular basis. Nowhere near the numbers that use marijuana. Um, as far as alcohol prohibition, uh, that didn't work. Most people will agree alcohol prohibition didn't work. Supporters of this say it's the same with marijuana. It's not working. Yeah, and they're not right. First of all, this isn't the 1930s, and we've learned a lot through policing and law enforcement since then. Unfortunately for them, they're stuck in the 1930s and keep wanting to talk about prohibition. We're not talking about prohibition. We're talking about keeping the current laws in place on marijuana that keep its use pretty low. Here's how it works. About 7.5% of Americans use marijuana today. About 65% use alcohol on a regular basis. Use is pretty low. You're never going to get zero any more than you're going to get zero poverty or zero unemployment. We've got it to about as low as we can get it and keep it. And I want to keep it low. And yet the other side will say that there is less societal cost under uh, medical marijuana at least as related to alcohol. And they will say that teen usage in states like Colorado and Washington, uh, teen usage has actually fallen with greater access to marijuana. How do you respond to that? Well, it depends what baseline year they're looking at. Teen use has actually increased in Colorado over 35% if you start before commercialization there. Teen use has increased here since about 2006 before we medicalized it. If you read the headlines of the major papers, you will see from the Washington Post, more Colorado voters try pot since it's become legal. New York Times, Colorado is now the second highest pot using state in the country. New York think, Times, marijuana to, use to, has increased in Colorado. Just to stop you there, yes, though, you're talking marijuana use. They're yes, talking sir. teen use. I am, too. 12 to 17-year-old use has increased over 30 percent since 2006 in Colorado. Since 2006, yes, but sir. since the law has actually been right. passed in Colorado, right. year, has that usage increased? A year increased? ago, we're trying to get those numbers, and we will have those numbers, Ted. When we look at usage increases on anything, it takes a couple years to suss it out. It took us five years to figure out what was going on with Vioxx. How long did it take us to figure out tobacco? We're not going to see changes overnight. Mark Kleiman is a professor at UCLA who studies marijuana and advises states on legalizing them. He's written the books on them and works with Rand. And he says it takes a few years to figure these things out. But when we look at the years, going back to before commercialization in those states, we see a rise in teen use. So uh, when the other side says that it would be more effective to simply tax and regulate uh, marijuana, it was certainly more effective to tax and regulate alcohol. Again, we're going back in the day, but that's the only place we can go as far as prohibition is concerned. Yeah. When they say it's the same with marijuana, 
You say... It's absolutely not the same. Alcohol has been used in this society and other societies from time immemorial. They took a legal substance, made it illegal, and re-legalized it with alcohol. We're dealing with an illegal substance. We're dealing with decades and decades of hard health care, educational, and substance abuse public policy that has kept this drug illegal and use low. If you want it to look like alcohol, or if they want it to look like alcohol, be prepared to see an increase of use like alcohol. In Arizona, according to our Arizona Youth Survey, we have a higher, we have 77% more of our teens using alcohol than marijuana. Are we really prepared for that? Uh, studies, they will say, uh, show that marijuana users are less likely to develop dependence than alcohol, and uh, greatly. This is a White House study by the National Academy of Sciences sure. and Institute of Medicine. Sure. Uh, that study is out there. How do you respond? Yeah, I mean, the addiction rates are different, but one-sixth of marijuana users in their, in their adolescent years will become addicted, also according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse. I don't think it's particularly healthy in public policy or any other kind of health care policy to start comparing what's better. Do you want your kids using alcohol versus tobacco? Do you want to be run over by a car or a bus? Addiction is addiction, and it's a dangerous substance that will lead to cognitive impairment will lead to addiction, it'll lead to dropouts, it'll lead to expulsions, and it'll lead to more arrests. Well, uh, again, I, I'm just the study that they threw at me, because sure. we had them on last week, the facts are, they say, decreased cost on enforcement, decreased cost on health care, because uh, no one, very few people on marijuana alone, if anyone has ever overdosed. Yeah, well, that's not true, particularly in Colorado. We now have three deaths associated with uh, marijuana associated use in how? Colorado. Uh, two homicides and one suicide. The CDC has put out a report on this about two weeks ago. We have... Uh, I'm sorry, but I have to stop you here yes, because, because that argument sounds interesting. It is. And yet you're saying because of marijuana, someone murdered someone else? Yeah, and we had it here in Arizona with Mr. Wakefield about a month ago who decapitated his wife and two dogs. He had smoked marijuana earlier in the day. If this were any other drug, if this were any other drug where we saw this rising rate of death increases, if we saw cannabis abuse syndrome like we saw with the murder of Chris Kyle, the American sniper, if we saw what we saw the, uh, at Virginia Tech, if we saw what we saw at the Boston Marathon bombing, if we saw what we saw at the Aurora uh, massacre, all of these were regular marijuana users, wouldn't we be looking more carefully at that? But is it, is it fair to associate those crimes and those people at all? all. They also probably brushed their teeth. Yeah. They also probably wore pants. Yeah. I mean, how can you say that they're associated when it's so far afield from what they actually did? Well, because there is not the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine and scientific journal after scientific journal saying that wearing your pants and brushing your teeth can cause psychosis, can cause uh, any number of problems with related to cognition, with related to judgment. This is a drug that affects the brain. It particularly affects the teen and adolescent brain. And study after study says that, and no study says it doesn't. Last question for you. Is it worth the money? Is it worth the effort? Is it worth the lives that are lost in Mexico, in America, and the underground drug trade to continue this quote-unquote war on marijuana? The chief of the Colorado associations, uh, the chief of the Colorado Police Association says the black market is thriving in Colorado. The marijuana black market is thriving in Colorado. The Rand Corporation said that you might reduce cartel income by about 3% if you legalized it in California. I don't think it's good public policy to legalize a dangerous substance that will negatively affect our youth to solve a problem in another country. It is a problem in another country. It's a big problem, but we have our own problems here, and they start with alcohol and tobacco, and we don't need to add marijuana. All right. We had the other side on last week. I'm glad we had you on this I week. Thank you. Good to have you here. Thanks nice for joining to see us. You.
The college football playoff will be held in Glendale next year at the University of Phoenix Stadium. Here to talk about preparations for the event is the game's director of operations and logistics, Layla Brock. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you so much. Good to have you here. Well, okay, defined terms here, what is the college football playoff? Thank you. The college football playoff is a uh, postseason bowl game. Um, basically, it replaces the BCS system. And so I know that folks in the Valley of the Sun were used to having the Fiesta Bowl serve as the national championship host in years past. But about two years ago, the conference commissioners came together and decided to host, have a playoff system. And so what that means is that the playoff games rotate between six bowl games every year. Um, this year will be the Cotton and the Orange Bowl, and the champions from those two games will come to, to Glendale and play in the national championship game. And as far as the playoff is concerned, I mean, you, you guys are an actual company, aren't you, with a board of directors and the whole nine yards? We are. We have a staff of about 15. We're in Irving, Texas, um, and so uh, we report to the conference commissioners. Our board of managers, basically, they run the event, and we carry out all the administrative duties on their behalf. And back to the game now, at the selection committee, we find out who's going to play in those semifinal games. Who, who, who are these people? <laughs> they are experts in college football. They really understand the game inside and out. Um, they're sitting athletic directors. They're former me members of the media. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, as you probably know, is, is on the committee mm -hmm. as well and knows football inside and out. And so they're very well qualified to pick the, the champions and the, uh, and, the, and the participants in our game. And as far as the event is concerned, now we have the championship game. That's that, correct. The guys are semifinals. <laughs> we get past them. But this is more than the game. Like the Super Bowl, we're talking about other stuff going on. Tell us about that. Exactly. So it's a three-day event, really. Actually, a four-day event for the fans and guests coming into the Valley of the Sun. Um, and we're delighted to host our franchise events in downtown Phoenix. And so those include our Playoff Fan Central, um, which will be hosted at the Phoenix Convention Center for about three days, January 8th through the 10th. Um, Family-friendly event, uh, sponsor activations, a ticketed event. And so we expect everyone to come on down there and have a really good time down there. And our second event is our AT&T Playoff Playlist Live. It's our concert series. And so that'll also be Friday through Sunday. Um, headline talent every night, a different genre every night. So something for just about every fan. Is that downtown as well? That's downtown as well. What's right. going on in Glendale besides the game? <laughs> That's a big deal. The game's outside out there. Um, but also fans who have access to tickets, fans who actually have a game ticket will have access to the championship tailgate as well. Um, so that's an event that's happening um, on game day on the stadium grounds. Okay, it, it, it's very similar to Super Bowl activity. We're used to Super Bowls out here. It mm -hmm. sounds very similar. It is, it is. It's very similar to Super Bowl. I would say it's a, it's a blend between the Super Bowl and the BCS National Championship games in the past and just kind of making it the best of both worlds. Um, this game really belongs to the fans. It's really, we make it fan friendly. It's not the corporate environment that you've seen with the Super Super Bowl, which is great for the Super Bowl and the NFL, but college football is really about the fans just down and dirty. Just They just love college football and they love everything that's associated with it. As far I mean, downtown Phoenix has a lot of activity. You got the tailgate and the game out in Glendale. What about Tempe? That's a big college town over there. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to give Tempe, Tempe some love as well. Um, Tempe is going to host our Extra Yard for Teachers 5K, um, and all the proceeds for that will benefit teachers in the local area and our Extra Yard for Teachers Foundation. And so preparation going on now, I would imagine. Yes. What's involved? A lot of travel. And so our group comes down from Dallas just about once a month, some of us more than more than others. Um, and so we come down here and work with the local Arizona organizing committee. Um, a lot of the folks who were involved with the Super Bowl are also involved with our national championship planning. And so we've got a great group of people who are, are willing to help us out in any way we can. And how much was learned at last year's event? I mean, that had to have been quite the model. I mean, first of all, did everything go as planned? It did. It did. Um, you know, it's so funny is that when you work in big events, everything seems to go in as planned. You know, as long as the fans don't see anything that's going on behind behind the scenes, we feel like it's it's gone well, and we felt like it really did. Um, there were a few fires, but you know, we put them all out. Um, we were fortunate enough to be nominated and, and were successful in winning the Sports Business Journal Sports Event of the Year, and so we felt like we were we did a, a great job, and, and with the help of everyone in North Texas who hosted the game for us in the first uh, in the first year of the playoff, uh, we felt like we did a fantastic job and I can't wait to bring it up down here to the Valley of the Sun. I know we have a lot of folks that are civic minded here, public mm -hmm. policy oriented, as far as that coordination with mm -hmm. Glendale, with downtown Phoenix, mm -hmm. Tempe, Scottsdale, all of these. What's involved here and, and how much activity is involved? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great deal of coordination and the city's done a great job. Like you said, having hosted the Super Bowl, they know what to do. They, they put together their working groups, the, the 
public safety, transportation, traffic, everyone, they all understand what's involved in a big event like this. And so they really coordinate through us and through the local organizing com committee to make sure that everything is covered. So as far as a timetable is concerned, what should fans watch for? I mean, we haven't even started the football season. I'm asking <laughs> what you're looking for. But, but I mean, this, this really never stops, does it? It doesn't. It really doesn't. You should start to see some information coming out from the Arizona Organizing Committee about how to get involved as a fan or just as a spectator. Um, so, you know, the local organizing committee will put things out in the newspapers and on the news about how people can come out and really help us out at the Fan Central, whether it's helping us out with, you know, some of the interactives or it's helping us out with some of the VIPs that are going to come into the into the area. Um, so that's what you can look to see. And then as far as um, some of the talent that will be announced, we're looking to do that in uh, in the late fall. And so mm -hmm. tickets will go on sale late fall. And so uh, we hope that you'll be excited about the, the talent that we're, we're hoping to get. Yeah, and it sounds like now this this college football playoff is going to be around for a while. Or are we gonna, I mean, they change this stuff all the time. <laughs> Wait, how far ahead are you looking? 12 years, yes. Wow. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, the way that the um, that cities are selected for this game is very similar to the Super Bowl, again, is that it's a competitive bidding process. So we're in the process of, of selecting the next few cities, the next three years. We have about nine cities bidding on it. Arizona was successful in our second bidding process, and so we were very happy for them to um, to be a part of the CFP family, and Tampa will be our host next year, and then after that, we're, we're figuring out who's going to be our host. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, all we care about is this year. Uh, exactly. Uh, good to have you here. Good luck with what promises to be quite the event. Thank well, you for joining excited. us. We're very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at creative aging, an effort to train and support older adults in the arts. The Arizona Commission on the Arts received a $225,000 grant from the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust that will help implement the program. Here with more is Alexandra Nelson with the Arizona Commission on the Arts. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this sounds very interesting now. When we talk about creative aging, what are we really talking about? So creative aging is a national movement to advance understanding of the vital relationship between creative expression and healthy aging. And it's also a term that we use to encompass the variety of arts programs that can serve adults across the aging spectrum. You know, when I first ask people if they're familiar with that term, the response I often get is, how does one age creatively? <laughs> <laughs> and I love that question. It was my first question, too. Um, but I think within that question, there's a little bit of discomfort. You know, we don't often think that we have a choice in how we age or that aging can be a positive thing. And as a society, that's starting to shift, but the creative aging movement is really about the unique ability of the arts to help us move from a deficits approach to aging that stresses losses to an assets approach that's about strengths, achievement, and potential. And it does, I mean, studies show this does help with general health, with cognitive abilities, the whole nine yards. Absolutely. You know, our sense of well-being is so important to our physical and mental health. And the things that make up that sense of well-being, living with purpose and joy, um, being able to deal with life's changes and challenges, and to sustain positive dynamic relationships, are often impacted as we age. And research has shown the clear and direct impact that the arts have on those three elements. Um, which is really exciting. And I, I, in my reading on this, it also helps people in, in the way that they see themselves. 
That is absolutely true. And that uh, ability of the arts to give people uh, meaning and purpose in the second half of life, I think is so exciting. There's a story um, shared by a theater company for older adults in California that I just love about uh, one of their participants who was discouraged as a young woman from following a career in acting. So she took a different life path but at the age of 60, after she retired, she joined this theater company and she worked with them until the age of 90. Wow. So she spent 30 years or a third of her life um, pursuing her passion in the arts and doing what she loved. On the stage, huh? On the stage. <laughs> so, and obviously that's one aspect of creative aging, aging in a creative way or using creative arts to age. Uh, painting, music, drama, writing, I mean, it can all be included, correct? It can all be included. All of the disciplines are included in quality creative aging programs. And really what they're about is um, active engagement as opposed to passive participation. And the involvement of a skilled teaching artist who really knows how to create those meaningful opportunities is a vital part of what we're looking for in quality creative aging programs. And, and in those programs, you do need instructors and you do need mentors and these sorts of things. How difficult is it to find folks who can, I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, I can't wait to teach these folks, but you gotta be able to communicate and get your point across to some folks who are probably pretty stuck in their ways in some <laughs> respects. Well, working with older adults is so different than working with youth, and a lot of teaching artists that we talk to would like to work with older adults, but their opportunities for training in our field are pretty limited to K through 12 age youth populations. So that was one of the reasons that we thought this AZ Creative Aging Initiative was so important. Um, to be able to have more artists who are able to go out and do this work. Let's talk about the initiative now, building local creative infrastructure. What does that mean? So creative aging as a movement is only about 10 years old. It's still an emerging field, really. So the AZ Creative Aging Nish Initiative, designed by the Arizona Commission on the Arts and supported by the Piper Trust, um, will provide professional development and network building support for teaching artists, arts organizations, and aging and healthcare service providers. And so that's really about a comprehensive plan to train artists, to uh, support the creation of more uh, creative aging programs for older adults, and embed creative aging and knowledge and best practices in communities. Um, developing that kind of uh, infrastructure for the field in Arizona is what we imagine will result at the end of the three years in more rich and varied opportunities for Arizona's older adults. And this is a three-year initiative now. Yeah. I, I, has everything been, been spaced out here and scheduled out as far as where you go, or is it just kind of move forward and find out what's next? So we're moving forward really fast. <laughs> we're deep in the planning process right now. The first programmatic component that we'll launch in a couple of months will be a Teaching Artist Institute. And from there, we'll introduce um, more programming for arts organizations, specialized training for staff of aging service organizations, as well as conference opportunities to bring the aging and uh, art sectors together. You mentioned Teaching Artist Institute is, uh, looks like it's the first on board. What is that? So that will be a six-month comprehensive institute to help artists understand the unique skills and abilities that they'll need to bring to the table in working with older adults. As we mentioned, older adults have unique needs and desires, and the relationship dynamic between instructor and, and participant is often very different when you're working with adults than when you're working with youth. So that institute will engage many of our fantastic local partners, as well as national experts and speakers, to give a, a broad understanding to artists about the variety of types of creative aging programs that exist. Is this, this program, this initiative, is it modeled after anything else going on in the country right now? Yeah, absolutely. There are some great models around the country and in Arizona, as I mentioned in the last decade, that have been developing. What's timely and unique about this initiative is that it is focusing on the relationship building across sector and the opportunity for um, network communities of practice where none yet exist. So, someone's listening to this and they go, I want to find out more. I think I've got the, uh, the great American novel in me <laughs> and I've, I'm retired and I'm ready to go. What do they do? Well, we hope that people will go to our website, 
azarts.gov and join our mailing list or follow our social media pages so that as this work develops, they'll be able to <laughs> learn more about the ways that they can get involved. Um, in particular, in the spring, we'll have some great opportunities to connect with some of those national speakers that we'll be bringing to Arizona. And we'll also be putting up more resources on our website about the local opportunities for people to engage in the arts. All right, very good. Good to have you here. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for joining us. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll learn more on why negotiations over inflation adjustments for education funding failed. And we'll have the latest on world issues with former NATO Ambassador Kurt Volker. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Arizona Artbeat is made possible in part by the Flynn Foundation, supporting the advancement of arts and culture in Arizona.